We're in Genesis chapter 3. And we'll be reading once again verses 1 through 7. Genesis chapter 3. Verses 1 through 7. Hear God's word to this church today. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Father, how quickly we move to demise. How quickly we, we go from the height of perfection in the garden that God has prepared for his special creation. No hint of sin or shame to fall so far to where his the ruinness of the world was at stake through Adam's disobedience. But Father, we didn't, um, we didn't stay there. You did not allow us to stay there, Lord, for you, you will and we will see soon that you provided a, a covering for Adam and Eve. Looking forward to the time that your son would come and, and by the shedding of his blood, give us a covering, a covering that would not only hide our sin but would wash our sin away and father i pray that as we go through these verses today that our mind would put would be put forward to the with the trajectory looking forward to christ's coming as we get into advent next week and then beyond that his second coming glorify yourself today father please I'll open our ears and our minds to understand your word this is your word that you have given to your church today help us to be obedient to it Help me, Lord, as I share. Again, as I've said before many times, it's my heart that if I should say something that is not of you, that is not scriptural, that is not in alignment with your word, that it would fall to the ground and not even go beyond this pulpit. It definitely would not be received into our ears and our heart. But wherein it is truth, help us to accept it as it is God's word to us today. And to that end, I give you thanks in advance for what you're going to do. In your name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Appreciate you. Well, I checked my pages and they seem like they're in order today. If there's one thought that stuck in your mind from last week's sermon besides me floundering and mixing up my pages, which is horrible, I trust that um, it was something of a real factor of Satan's extreme craftiness. And that that craftiness did not stop in the Garden of Eden, but it began in the Garden of Eden after heaven is thrown out of heaven, and it continues to today. Hopefully there was left with you an impression of some degree that is not to soon be forgotten in your walk with Christ. That was my intent. I pause at verse 1 on purpose because there have been so many people who have grown accustomed to Satan's subdued, blending in presence in the world that they let their guard down. And they incline themselves realistically to believe his lies on occasion rather than accepting the ongoing God's tr transformative, powerful, never watered down, never changing truth. Jesus prayed in his priestly prayer in John chapter 17. He said to the Father, sanctify them in your truth, in the truth. Your word is truth. He said, set them apart, Father, by and in your word, this word we have before us today. And if you are in Christ, that's exactly what he's going to do. Because he is a faithful God. And he loves us. Think about it. And we'll leave here shortly. But as the serpent 
was victorious over Adam and Eve in their lives when they lived and worshiped God in a perfect relationship with God, we better take very seriously the events of Genesis chapter 3, primarily to establish for you and I that any sin breaks a relationship with God, destroys it, hurts it. That you and I would run sooner to put on the full armor of God. That it's not the last article in the closet that you put on, but it's the first article in the closet of every day that you live. You run in the closet of the Word of God and you put on the full armor of God. That you stop cowering in the corner with fears and you fight furiously with God's greater provision that we find in Christ's blood in our lives through the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit of God with the all-sufficiency of God's Word before us. And to pray more fervently and earnestly live in an attitude of prayer and thanksgiving. That we would know the reality of 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13. Turn with me if you would. It's one verse, but it's worth turning to if you would. Chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians. Verse 13. I'll give you a minute to get there. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13. Paul writes to the church at Corinth, to the church at Corinth, he says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Didn't necessarily say be removed from it. That could happen too, but that you can endure it. And I challenge you, I challenge myself that we would add this verse to our memory arsenal. And when the enemy begins to attack us and accuse us and try to sway us from what we know is the truth of God's word, that we would pull that out of the, the file of our heart and blast him with it. Enough of that. All right, listen, once again to the question that the Satan, uh, or the serpent in this case, asks Eve in verse 1, the second part. He says, he said to the woman, to Eve, Did God actually say you should or shall not eat of any tree in the garden? You know, there are entire religions that have surfaced and, and um, are maybe growing even that answer that very question very similarly to Eve and what she said. They take God's word and they add to it to grow their church. Or they miss the warnings and they tear them out and they don't want the warnings. They're too, they're too damning. The people don't need that. Let's remove that from Scripture. Make our, our church service more appealing to more people. Or they listen to the very enemy of God who has absolutely no desire for the truth. In fact, the truth is not in him. They have thoughts in their heart and their desires as something like this. Surely today there's room for personal interpretation, especially considering how far we've come, how times have changed. Surely there's room for special and private interpretation of God's word. 2 Peter 1.20 reminds us, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. Some actually take the task to consider ways, and that's what they do. They just ponder ways that they can avoid God's truth. That they take God's word and how it doesn't apply to our society, and they build that up over God's word. They think maybe things like this, that, that the word has lost some potency. Where God's word says it's powerful and sharper. No, maybe over time. Anything dulls out over time. I mean, years have gone by. It's no longer sharper than any two-edged sword. But it's more dull. It can't pierce the soul anymore. Or we don't like what Paul had to say in all of his many writings about women in the church. And so therefore we're just going to X all of that out or we're going to rip it out of the Bible. It won't become part of our understanding of God's word or the canon of scripture. I mean after all we are a new awakened generation of people are we not? Egalitarianism is on the rise. In church you better look out for it. 
Church of the Living God, the moment you hear anyone say that God's word is no longer relevant for today in any way, shape, or form, or in totality, you better run. <laughs> because any other word that comes out of their mouth, I can almost guarantee is going to be a lie. For they have fallen for the greatest lie. That there's nothing to this word anymore. God's word is, it transcends time. When God wrote the word to these many people over these many years, he did not have to ponder, well, what's it going to look like in 2022? How can I change it to make it more affluent and make it more personal? It's already affluent and it's already personal. This is God's word. God has not introduced any new revelation since the, the, the 66 books have been written and known as his canon. No matter the year we live in, whether it's 2022 or 2085, my friends, rather you and I as the church, as born again believers in Christ, we need to be immersing ourselves in this word. Not listening to what the world says that is no longer relevant. Devoting your time to learn it and obey it. Heed its warning Heed its, its, and embrace its joy and its peace and its calming effect and its, its love. No matter what year we live in. And yes, memorize the scriptures. I am not good at that. I need prompting. In fact, I would love for some of you to come up to me after church or sometimes say, I want to hold you accountable to memorize more scripture. I would love that. I need that. And maybe you do too. Maybe I'm not the only one. But the Bible says, his word I've hidden in my heart so that I won't what? Sin against him. If you're a Christian and you don't want to sin against God, the greatest garment, garment you have in the arsenal is to memorize scripture. When Satan went to Jesus in the, in the desert, he didn't flounder around and try to come up with all kinds of this and that and the other thing. He gave him scripture, pure word of God. And what did Satan have to leave? Memorize scripture. And if we do, we will recognize that Satan's defeat and his lies that he wants to bring to us will much quicker leave us. They won't be lingering around. They'll be gone in a haste. So try that. If you, want, if you find yourself prone to temptation and failure in temptation, try memorizing some scripture that deal with that, like the one we said this morning in 1 Corinthians, and blast him with it. Now, where did Satan learn that of God's words to Adam and Eve anyway? Well, it's uncertain, and Moses did not consider it to be of great importance. He didn't elaborate here. But it's possible um, that's not the first encounter that Adam and Eve had with the serpent. Perhaps they were instructing this being so that he too would be on guard against this, this tree in the, in the midst of the garden. Um, maybe they cared enough about him that they didn't want to see him die. I don't know. But it's difficult to have Satan or the serpent involved in day six, as it were, because God looked out at day six and what did he say? Everything was very Good. So shortly after that, somehow or another, Satan learned of this. Don't know exactly how it was that he learned it, but he learned it. Someone stated that where the Bible has no voice, we should have no ears. I think that's a good line for you and I to go by because there are a lot of people who write things into the Bible the Bible says this. No, it doesn't. And we're, they read between the lines, and so this, therefore this must mean, I've kind of hinted at that a little bit with Satan or the serpent and how he came about understanding what Adam and Eve knew about his restriction, God's restrictions for them. But they'll take it so far that it becomes biblical and truth. So don't have ears to hear where God's word is not, has no voice. I know this much that I don't believe that Satan read their minds. He might have heard them discussing it in the garden amongst themselves, but he doesn't read minds. God is, I mean, Satan is not all knowing. So we don't understand where it came from, but we know this much about Satan. He was up to no good. And when he did find out, he was up to 
caused devastation in that Garden of Eden. And let's remember what Bruce Walkie, Walkie said last week. I mentioned it. He has, he was not, Satan was not involved in a theological discussion, but he subverts obedience and distorts perspective by emphasizing God's prohibition, not his provision. Sorry about that. You awake now? Reducing God's command to a question, doubting his sincerity, defaming his motives, and destroying the truthfulness of his threat. Eve in her innocence, she listens and she answers this question that was posed to her in verses 2 and 3. And the woman said to the serpent, verse 2, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Satan, I mean, serpent, you're, how misinformed are you? Of course we can eat of the fruit in the trees of the, in the garden. Of course we can. They're our food. God has given it to us to provide for nourishment in our bodies. It's our food. But since you mentioned it, there's one tree in the midst of the garden that we should not eat of it. It's standing there in the midst of the garden. And when we even touch the tree, we're going to die. It will bring death. Well, did the serpent leave her answer well enough alone? My friends, Satan is always on the prowl to deceive. He has a plan and a desire to tempt into sin. He wants to bring death. He wants to bring death into your life, the death of your vision, the death of your hope, the death of your victory over sin in your life. Can you see what he did? He took God's positive message of provision all these trees you can eat, but just that one don't. He took the, the provision of God and his warning and he turned it around. And in so doing, what serp, the serpent or Satan does is put question into God's warning for disobedience. He speaks of a negative reflection on what God said to Adam, which opens a door wide for discontentment. Did God, you mean all this? Open a little bit of crack in the door for, do, for Eve to become discontent in God's provision. And in so doing, he exposes his craftiness and basically calls God a liar. The one who is not a man that he should lie. Calls God a liar. He says, you will not surely die. You will not surely die. Who should you believe? Someone who says you're going to die if you do this? Or my word that says, no, that's not what it's all about. It's not going to bring forth death. It's actually going to bring forth better life. What are you going to believe? A, mess, a message of prosperity, which promises you wealth and affluence, or a message of persecution for everyone who lives godly in Christ Jesus to suffer? Which do you want to hear? As I looked again at this, this passage, I, I wondered why he, um, Satan did not attack Eve's addition to the restriction when she says, neither shall you touch it. Well, if he knew enough of what God had said in the first place, he probably knew that, knew that that was not part of what God had said. You see, if he had done that, the only thing that would have accomplished was to perhaps point out her mistake of adding to God's command. He would have pointed out and it would have saved her a lot of despair, um, desperate ways and things that would happen. But he would just point that out. Oh, yeah, you're right. He didn't say that. But that's far less effective than trying to convince her to disbelieve God's truth. Did God really say? Isn't there an, a moment that you can begin to disbelieve God's truth. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And you don't feel his presence. What are you going to believe? What you feel or what God's word says. You need to believe what God's word says. He's not a man that he should lie. He's not going to say I'll never leave you or forsake you. And then leave you and forsake you. He's not going to do that. No rather he waters down God's warning. By removing or at least calling to question the, the rightful fear that she should have experienced if she was to follow through on God's 
plan. You see, removing fear, most people think is pretty good, right? I mean, removing a lot of fear is good, and sometimes it's, it's good for us, and it can be very healthy, but a, a God-provided fear is not one to be removed, it's one to be embraced. It's one to look to, to find support and encouragement and guidance and how you take your next step. If God says, don't go there, it's a landmine, it's a lie, and you step there, you've disobeyed God, you've, you've forsaken His warning. His warnings are good. It is the fear of the Lord that is the beginning of wisdom. And probably why we have so many ignorant Christians out here today is because they don't fear God enough. Yeah, that's what I said. The reason we have so many ignorant Christians today is because they do not fear God enough. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28, and do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. He is the one to be feared, not Satan, not your, your, your enemy, your neighbor that doesn't like you because you're a Christian or someone at work or whatever the case might be. They're not to be feared. I mean, what's the absolute worst they can do is take your, take your life from you. And if you're in Christ, that's just glory. But rightful fear rests in appreciating and knowing and loving the God who is to be feared above all things, above all people. Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? So he manipulates her own words to alter the application. The Bible reminds that us, that us that our heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can understand it? We all too often can become um, or come to the place that we believe something because it's what we want rather than what is best for us. Especially when it comes to the word. Especially when it comes to truth. A truth that's hard. A truth that costs you something in the way you live your life before other people and before Almighty God. I don't know why or how at this point Eve would take the freedom to embellish God's words as she did to include the, the idea that even if you touch the tree then you would, you would die from that, but she did. And in doing so, she successfully speaks to modify the prohibition of God's word to her and to Adam, but she could not absolutely eliminate it God's warning still stood. God's warning was still true. You can try to manipulate God's warning all day long. It doesn't work. You'll never change him. It's true because God spoke it. The truth remains the truth whether we believe it, whether we try to add to it, or whether we want to take away from it. God's word is as he is, the same yesterday, today, and forever. It will not change. And I'm grateful, and you should be too. Well, with the order found in chapter 2, verse 16, which says, And the Lord God commanded the man, it's likely that Eve was not present when God instructed Adam in the beginning. And maybe Adam might have added the, and not touch it, or whether she took it upon herself to do that. We don't understand or, or really know for sure whether Adam communicated that to her or whether she just took it upon herself. But it's doubtful because they are still in the setting of perfection. They are without sin at this point in time in their life in the Garden of Eden. So I don't think that her intent was to lie. Last I checked, lying is still a sin. And since she is not sinful at this point, it's doubtful that she wanted to lie some malicious intent to disguise what she really wanted to say since it had not yet been brought into the lives there. But with this exa exaggeration, if nothing else, it allowed an opening for the serpent to take her words and have some consideration of changing them. He saw in her now a weakness to, re to receive and to apply God's word. You see, once you crack that door open that you find in God's word some area of of concern, of, of untruthfulness or hesitation, you open yourself up to believe any of it or not to believe any of it. 
I don't know how in the world people can decide that this is not, this is not, this is not scripture, so get rid of it and accept everything else when God's word says it's all to be accepted. It's his written word. He saw a weakness and exploited it. He does so for you and I too. He sees our weaknesses. Again, I don't think he knows our minds, but he hears our words. He knows how we spend our time when we're by ourselves. He knows what we look at, what we listen to, what we read. He knows these things. If we begin to doubt the truthfulness of God's word in the slightest way, we're in grave danger and we open this door wide open for Satan to come in and to destroy all of it in our mind. The serpent continues to throw out words that God had not said in verses four and five. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil. She overlooks the truth for a lie and she jumps immediately to the idea introduced in verse five. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. Unfortunately, she failed to cling to the reality and remind, be reminded of herself that she was already like God to some degree. We're not gods, we're not even small g gods. But the Bible tells us, we read it in, in the first part of Genesis, that we were created in His image as a, some image of God in us. Some, we're, we're His image bearers, we're His imago Dei. So in some ways we are like God. We can communicate with God, we can understand, we can, we can think things through, we can, we can love the way God loves and so forth and so on. But she forgot to remember that. You see how quickly we can fall away from the truth? I wonder how often we do the same thing. We fail to remember that we are his Amago Day, that we should be bearing his witness to the truth every day that we live. We, they, fall for lies resulting in disobedience and defiance before God. They broke God's commandment and we sometimes do as well. I wonder if, if we realized every day when we woke up that this is another day for the Imago day to walk out into the world and to be his ex example before men and, men and women, how that might change our decisions. I don't know, just saying. When Jesus tells us that if you love me, you will keep my commandments, he's not trying to be difficult. He's demonstrating a love far beyond what we understand. A love that's purposeful and beneficial. Do you see that? There's a world out there, even who profess to be Christian, who want to do away with God's harsh commandments. But do we not understand that they're just for our good? Well, they are. His love for you and I will not leave us as we are. How are you keeping God's commandments? Do you see them as suggestions? as burdensome. First John reminds us that they're for our sanctification. And when we fail here, we open ourselves up to be an easy target for Satan to persuade and misdirect our walk of obedience and faith, to change that to one of disobedience and faithlessness. Oh, how soon we fall to faithlessness. It doesn't take much to compound one disappointment to another disappointment to another disappointment and then all of a sudden your faith is almost non-existent. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You need to get back into the word and build that faith back up. Think for a moment the area in which he attacked Eve. He questioned her. It was an, an attack on God's provision, was it not? A provision for food in this case. He questions her physical well-being. He attacks her in their, her physical well-being. God isn't too, taking good care of you, is he? Well, else he would have not have, have hesitated or limited your ability to go in and enjoy the food that he's provided for you. He doesn't know have your best interest in heart. He knows that it's a delight to the eyes. Wouldn't that also be on his approval list if he really cared about you? Would it not be out of bounds any longer as long, if, he, if he realized just how much you wanted it? Look, it's right there. It's right down there. It's right within your reach. 
Surely God did not mean to exclude this one. He isn't concerned, concerned about your infrequent visits to a particular website, is he? He doesn't care if you linger just for a little while at that immoral bill, billboard every time you go up and down 51 or wherever it is you might see that billboard. He doesn't care if you just hang out once in a while with those so-called friends. Or if you watch that TV program or you read that love novel that takes your mind to places it shouldn't go. Think about it, Eve. Think about a church. Why would it look so good if God didn't want you to have it? Hmm. Can you not hear him say that to her in so many words? Only someone on par with Satan to want to deceive and to tear down would think this way. And his lies activates her taste buds very quickly for the forbidden. It is true that what they say about food, that we, we taste food with our eyes before we do our, our tongue, our taste buds, I think it's very true here. Even as we read it from the scripture, that's what Eve did here in verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. She saw the tree was good for food. It was a delight to her eyes. Both good things, right? Right? And since the serpent included the idea of reminding her that it's to make her wise, she no longer considered God's prohibition, and she took the fruit and she ate it and turned and gave some to Adam and said, here, this is not at all what we thought it was. And Adam said, no, Eve, did you not hear God? What? I refuse to take it from you. I'm not going to fall for that. <laughs> no, he didn't, and neither do we. We're just like Adam sometimes when someone holds out some forbidden fruit. What's the harm? And we take it in. Her response is so much like us today, isn't it? We see what God has provided for us and yet we desire more. Enough is no longer enough. Commandments of God become suggestions of God. People have wonderful spouses and yet they choose to cheat. We have enough money to live on and yet we, we long for the riches of the lottery ticket or becoming a workaholic so we can put more money in the bank. Every tree in the garden, but just not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was God's restriction to keep his creation holy and they failed. When the council told Peter and the apostles who were with him to stop teaching in Jesus' name. Peter said in Acts chapter 5, verse 29, we must obey God rather than man. Oh, that she had had that scripture in her hand, in her memory bank, when Satan came to her. Oh, I must obey God rather than you. And it's just as true for us today. And we could go off on a trajectory and talk about what Adam should have done, being the head of the household, as it were, the husband but the serpent saw what was there in the woman, not in the man. We could go off onto that to some degree, merely speculations oftentimes. But the Bible doesn't, and we won't either this morning. And you can say amen. But regardless, she failed. She failed. They both sinned, and Adam became our representative, which we've talked about earlier on in, in, in Genesis. He became our representative head, so that everyone born since him, since then, inherits a sin nature that exposes our inclination to commit sin at the first opportunity. That's why you don't have to teach children what wrong looks like. They're inclined to sin. From God's perspective, they're not innocent. They're not innocent. What the tree of knowledge of good and evil represents is mirrored for us in John, first, first John chapter 2. I want to read that for you quickly this morning. We've been there. We've, we've spent many, probably many weeks on it. First John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. John writes, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life, 
is not from the Father, but from the world. See, they don't have, they haven't captured it completely enough that John did not have to repeat it, even for us today. We repeatedly fall into the same distractions, don't we? Don't think for one moment that Satan does not continue to take what God provides for you and for myself as sufficient and good, and he shrouds it with some area of discontentment and appeal to cause us to sin. Has God really said? He continues to use it. It worked once. Why improve on the wheel? Because it's going to continue to happen over and over and over again. Has God really said to you in your life? Remember, as a roaring lion, the devil seeks, to those, seeks those he can devour. Not merely scratch, but devour. He preys on those who are spiritually weak and continue to hang out, eyeing the forbidden fruit. He goes to those who are tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. I'll go to this church this week or this month because they teach this. I'll go to this church over here with completely different doctrine because they teach this. And tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. That's childish. Show some maturity. Settle in on what you believe God's word to say and believe it until such a time God changes your mind by the word of God and by his spirit. Here's Satan, church, this morning. Did God actually say? Many have believed it. Well, I'm only watering down the sermon to bring people into the church. That's good, right? I mean, the church grows numerically. That's a good thing, right? Or, or the core biblical values can be removed because they no longer are held to be truth. We're in dangerous, we're in dangerous waters when we do that. He's effective, and when we fail to keep our mind stayed on Christ, he's right there. And so she eats and gives some to her husband, her husband who is with her. I'm winding down. Listen, if but God, and I believe it to be true, are two of the most amazing, wonderful words in the Bible for all kinds of reasons, then and he ate are perhaps three of the worst in all the Bible. For they brought a deep-seated spiritual death that would affect all mankind. Every man, woman, boy, and girl that was born since then. Romans 5, 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men. Now, it's not just Adam. That is anthropoi. Anthropoi, men and women, just because you're not a male today does not exclude you from this horrendous blessing from Satan through Adam for all men because all have sinned. Anthropoi, men and women. Adam served as the perfect undefiled man in every way, yet he yielded to sin's temptation. So many today believe they can defeat sin by their own defiled, unrighteous will. They don't realize that they're in spiritual deadness. They're blind. They have a heart of stone. The will is broken. And yet they think that in their own ability, their own will, that they can come to Christ. They can't. And not only can they not, they will not. They think they can work up their faith and accept God, God's salvation in their own methods, their own ways. My friends, if we could see that Adam failed in his area of faith in this perfect setting without a sin-inclined heart, how do we ever think that we in our own strength can survive and provide faith that God would expect or accept for us? It has to come from outside of ourselves. In order to obtain saving faith, it has to come from the one who has saving faith. And you don't have it apart from Christ. And I don't have it apart from Christ. When Adam fell, it affected his entire being, his mind, his emotions, his will. What did they say? The first thing they did was, hey, we're, we're, we're in shame now. 
We've got to cover ourselves before we go see God. And then at that, they want to run from God. They didn't want to run to God anymore. Affected their will, their mind, their emotions. God's electing love and His call and regeneration is our only hope for breaking sin's death grip on us. We would never choose God over our sin when we're left to ourselves. But thanks be to God that He is faithful in His own way to bring us to Christ. Their eyes were open. They had shame. They knew their nakedness. And now they must run away from God rather than to Him. Do you not feel like that when you, even, even as a Christian, if, if you fall into some area of sin? Isn't one of the first things you want to do is, where, I, I don't want God around me. I, I want to run from Him. I want to hide until this shame is removed. So you can imagine how they felt. They've not experienced anything but perfect relationship with God. God, creator God, walking with them in the cool of the evening and befriending them and having a relationship. <clears throat> and as soon as their eyes were open, oh, we're in shame. We've, we've sinned against God. Let's hide. Let's hide. Let's at least cover ourselves. You see, sin prevents relationship for the unbeliever and it breaks fellowship for the Christian. And when you and I are in sin, whether it's for a moment or for a long time, it prevents us from seeing his holy, holy, holiness. They saw their nakedness, as one commentary put it, it was the stripping of the glory of holiness from their soul. Hear that again. It was the stripping of the glory of holiness from their soul. How dreadful and sad. Oh, but God. Oh, but God. Are you a believer who's still discontent in the provisions that God has given you in your life? Do you continue to seek the forbidden fruit, knowing that the Father wants better for you and for your life? Repent of your sin. Accept his forgiveness and turn from that which draws you to itself. If you're not a believer this morning and you recognize that you've been running from God instead of to him, confess your sin. Recognize that Jesus is the one who forgives sin. He has paved the way for forgiveness. Accept the good news of Christ. Turn to Jesus, repent, and know the saving grace that he offers. Finally, see Satan as the father of all lies and accept Christ as your savior. Don't waste any more time trying to sow fig leaves on your shame to cover that. But see that God has provided a covering for your sin, which is the blood of Christ. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. For if we confess our mouth with our mouth, this is what this is, another scripture. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we will be saved. Run there. Don't continue to be in your shame. Run to God. Run with your shame. Run with your sin. And let him replace it with his righteousness in Christ. Pray with me. Oh, how good it is when we're able to come before the throne of God through his word and worship him. Father, I pray that as we leave this place today that this idea, this reality of, of, of worshiping you fully without shame and hindrance would be our example to the world. Help us to grow in an understanding and meditation and memory of your word that we can get rid of the enemy when he attacks us. And we love you. And I thank you for your word that you never change and it will not either. It's what we need for life and godliness. Thank you. Pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Please stand.